I'm uh, really excited to be able to talk to you guys today because whenever my mom is in healthcare and whenever she talks about healthcare professionals, she makes you all sound really old and stuffy. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, I'm really glad that I'm here with like the cool kids of healthcare who aren't scared by innovation. Uh, as I was already introduced, but again, it is my birthday. Uh, I'm now 17, and I am graduating in two days. I have a little bit more experience with healthcare than the average teenager because I have so many different diseases and conditions, sometimes I can't even remember them. But I'll do my best. Let's see, I have asthma, eczema, uh, I suffer from sleep deprivation, I'm also an activist for too much homework. Um, I, I'm allergic to nuts, but the, my favorite one, by far, is type 1 diabetes. I would definitely recommend it to everyone out here. I used to call myself a diabetes evangelist, but they're actually paying me like, real money to come talk to you guys. So now I can say I'm a professional diabetic. <laughs> Just to describe a little bit about my situation with diabetes, I, you know, I do everything myself. I check my blood sugar, give myself my own shots, my own insulin. Uh, and my last, well, when I was first diagnosed with diabetes, my hemoglobin A1C was over 11, which for those of you who don't know, was very, very high. Uh, and now, my, uh, my latest hemoglobin A1C was 6.0. So, just so you guys can get to know me a little bit better, uh, I'm gonna explain four reasons that I would recommend diabetes to anyone. And if, uh, you know, even if you don't learn anything about the millennial, millennial perspective of healthcare, but you come away from this conference thinking, man, I should really try and get diabetes, then. <laughs> I'll at least have done a little bit of my job. So the first reason is uh, that diabetes, I think, helps a lot with fitness. Oh, another disclaimer, as I'm not a healthcare professional, um, I'm probably going to get some of the lingo wrong. So in this case, what I really meant was health and fitness. But if I say doctor when I mean provider, please refrain from throwing tomatoes at me. <laughs> so the, the reason that diabetes really helps you with fitness is that if you're always constantly counting carbs and, and meticulously calculating your meals, you really can't get fat. You would have to try very hard. And I think a lot of the reasons that people overeat is not because they sit down and they say, all right, I'm gonna overeat today, let's do it. But it's just because they're not really paying attention. So I think diabetes really helps you uh, pay attention to that. And another thing is, um, it's made me more aware of my health and fitness in general. So now that my diet is really good, uh, I've started, as uh, Deb said, you know, working out a lot, running different things. So it's really made me aware that health is something that I can even improve more on. So the next reason I would recommend diabetes, and I think uh, actually almost any chronic disease could fit several of these categories, is that it really helps out your relationship. Although, don't, don't go to your patients and tell them, be thankful for your chronic disease, because they probably will throw tomatoes at you. <laughs> but the cool thing about diabetes is that because it is more or less external, you have to you know, check your blood sugar, which involves needles, it involves blood, and all those kinds of exciting things. Um, it's, it's the best icebreaker ever. You, normally in high school, you sit down the first day, and it's really awkward, you just kind of like, and that's pretty much the whole conversation. <laughs> But if you just pull out your glucometer and start stabbing yourself, <laughs> instant conversation. Uh, now sometimes you do get people who are afraid of blood who sometimes react like this. That's my friend Amelia. She's also the most high-pitched person I know, and she calls it shooting. So she's like, are you going to shoot yourself? Um, but actually, I haven't gotten many complaints about people who are afraid of blood, but my friend Carl, is uh, deathly afraid of needles, but he just watched me check my blood sugar every day and kind of inoculated himself against that. And a couple weeks later, he got in a car accident and they had to stick all kinds of needles in him and stuff. And he came back and told me that he was completely fine. I was like, diabetes saves the day again. <laughs> the third reason that I would recommend diabetes or any other chronic disease, if you have the opportunity to get one, is... <laughs> is that it really helps out your, uh, your opportunities. So in this case, I have the opportunity to come and give this talk today, which is really exciting. Uh, but also, I think in America, and I don't want to get too philosophical on you, but uh, America is really a culture of overwork. 
you know, you miss one day of work and people are like, oh, you must be lazy. And the more time you spend, the more respected you are. So that really leads to a culture of not getting enough sleep, which is a problem. But with diabetes, you, it's stress and sleep are two huge influences on blood sugar. So I really have to rein myself in and say, no, I'm, I have to go to sleep today. And it's just a really good way to not overwork myself to have this disease. It's a good excuse. <laughs> and finally, it really helps out with my happiness. And this is the one that applies to really any hardship uh, that, that you might have in your life. Because the best way to explain it is this. I've accomplished all these cool things. You know, I'm graduating in three years with a stellar GPA. But how much cooler is it that I did all that and I had diabetes at the same time? <laughs> So now you know a little bit more about my situation with healthcare. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys about what you actually want to hear about, which is uh, sort of my perspective on how healthcare works today. And I think that uh, as a teenager, we get the short end of the stick a lot of the time, um, not just in healthcare, but in school especially. Don't get me started on that. Uh, but there are a lot of different considerations that need to be taken into account when dealing with teenagers. Although if I, were, if I was to give just one tip, treat teenagers the same as anyone else. That would really go a long way. And I also think, not just, I'm not just going to give you the perspective of how to deal with teenagers in healthcare, but also I think that just looking at, a health, looking at healthcare from a different perspective, from the teenage perspective, can give some insights on how to deal with all patients, regardless of their age. So the way I see it is that the most, sorry, that was kind of loud, that the most uh, <laughs> important thing in healthcare is the patient-provider relationship. Because as a doctor or, or as a provider, you know, you've gone to school for years and years uh, to you know, get your degrees and figure out how to properly diagnose and treat patients. But as a patient, I don't see that at all. I expect that my doctor is going to diagnose me and treat me properly, and if they're not, there's something wrong on their end that really needs to be fixed. But I'm not really going to be able to tell until months later if I was misdiagnosed. So, because healthcare is really a two-step process. It's the diagnosis, and then it's the communication of the diagnosis to the patient. And that's the only part that I see, uh, especially as a teenager. So the only difference between a good appointment and a bad appointment is, in a good appointment, my doctor was really cool, you know, we got along well, and I have this plan that I'm gonna, gonna implement. And in a bad appointment, it's like, that doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. So, you really have to have a good uh, relationship with your patient, or else it does lead to non-compliance, which obviously is not a good thing. So the best sort of uh, patient-doctor relationship is one where the patient and the provider are on the same team, which probably sounds pretty obvious. But I'm going to give you some examples of uh, poor relationships with doctors or uh, providers that I've had in the past to kind of show the contrast there. So in a condescending relationship, and I, I've had this a lot, especially when I was younger and I had a higher pitched voice. Um, <laughs> With, with the growth spurts, it's been helping, a lot with, helping out a lot with that, but I still get it on occasion. And that's basically where a doctor or a provider makes the patient feel stupid. Nobody likes feeling stupid. Um, and I think this is really, really applicable to teenagers. So I would caution anyone to be very careful not to be condescending towards teenagers. And the other thing with being condescending, it's really subtle. A lot of the times you wouldn't even realize it until someone points it out. So let me give my favorite example. This really annoys me because it's so easy to correct, but I've never seen anyone do this properly. It's a vocabulary error in healthcare. Never use the word poke. <laughs> a poke is when you prod someone with your finger. However, a stab is when you insert a sharp metal object into a patient's skin with the intention of drawing blood or injecting a foreign substance into the body. If a doctor told me he was going to poke me, and then he went and stabbed me, he's a liar! <laughs> but on top of that, it's like, do you think that I'm, I'm so, uh, you know, squeamish that I can't bear to hear the word stab? I mean, have you seen a PG-13 movie recently? <laughs> I, I think that as a teenager, I can bear to hear the word stab. And it's, that's what you're going to be doing to me anyway, so you might as well tell it like it is. And th there are examples like that of a uh, patient-doctor relationship becoming condescending. Now, another type of relationship that gets on my nerves a little bit would be a dictatorial relationship. 
This is similar to a condescending relationship, but it's basically putting the doctor over the patient. And uh, the problem with this is that the patient really should be the primary driver of their own health care. And if you have a dictatorial relationship, a lot of the times the patient's goals might not get accomplished. So let me give you another example of uh, when this has happened to me in the past. When I was first diagnosed with diabetes, they, you know, they gave me a ton of information, but a small bit of the information that they gave me was what to do when you have low blood sugar. And what you're supposed to do, you check your blood sugar, realize it's low, and then you're supposed to drink some uh, liquid with sugar in it, wait 10 minutes, check your blood sugar again, then you can give yourself insulin and eat. Well, when I, you know, that sounded fine, fine and dandy at the time, but when I went back to my normal life, I realized that my lunch period is 20 minutes long. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I check my blood sugar and uh, I wait 10 minutes, you know, drink the liquid and give myself insulin, and then I would have to eat like this. <laughs> and that just wouldn't work out in my lifestyle. So what I had to do is kind of change my treatment on the fly and experiment on myself, which is never a good thing. Um, and basically what I changed it to was just skipping the 10 minutes and eating more food. But how this could have been avoided is if uh, my provider and I simply had a conversation that um, when they told me, you know, this is what you're supposed to do, then if they had, if they had only asked, and part of it was, you know, my fault that I should be seeing if it's going to fit into my lifestyle as well. But I think many patients don't know that. So if my doctor had only said, you know, do you think this is something that you're going to be able to do? Is this going to be convenient in your lifestyle? Then that would have been much more effective because we could have found a treatment that uh, maybe it would have been a little suboptimal, but it would have been something I could actually do rather than resorting to experimenting on myself, which is never what we want. Uh, so now sometimes if uh, in avoiding this dictatorial relationship and really working with a patient like that, you are going to end up with, uh, or we do end up with treatments that are suboptimal, not perfect, but my favorite author is Tim Ferriss, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but he has a, a saying that's something like this. The substandard treatment that is actually adopted is infinitely better than the perfect treatment that is ignored. And <laughs> in, a, in a dictatorial relationship like this, where my provider is simply telling me what to do, a lot of times it will just ignore my lifestyle and we won't be able to come up with that treatment that I can actually do. Because uh, that's another thing with teenagers, and you know, never stereotype them like this, but if something isn't going to work, then they just won't listen to it. And that's why we really have to find a treatment that will work. The final poor patient-doctor relationship is an adversarial relationship. This is the one that has happened to me most recently. It's basically uh, similar to the previous ones, but uh, more in the past tense. So I went to my dietician recently. And I told her about my, my whole low blood sugar situation, as, I, as I've just explained. And then we had like an hour-long argument about whether I was allowed to skip the waiting period of 10 minutes or not. And th there was, this was a complete waste of time. There was nothing to be gained from this at all. Obviously, she, she told me that that's not the optimal treatment. I said there was no way I could possibly change it. And then we had an argument for like an hour that all it did was waste time and worsen our relationship and we lost respect for each other. If only uh, instead of having this, this adversarial relationship, um, you know, if only she had met me where I was at and just worked with me, it would have been so much easier. <laughs> it was also pretty funny because at the time I had a ton of homework, so I was walking around like this. And I had a hood on and like baggy pants. I might have even had a chain. So she was totally thinking I was a juvenile delinquent. Um, and so then she was just in her head, okay, well, he's not going to listen to anything I have to say, so I have to just beat him over the head with my treatment until he listens to me. <laughs> and at one point, about like an hour and a half in, she stops and she goes, wait, are you an overachiever? And I was like, yes, finally we're on the same page. <laughs> So there are obviously some relationship issues that, relationship issues, that sounds kind of funny. Uh, there are some problems that I've had with a few providers in the past, although, you know, my provider team is, is excellent. But how can, we, how can we fix that? And the solution is pretty simple. It's just to meet the patient where they're at. So what, what this would have meant for me in, uh, in, in my dietitian appointment, it, bless you, is, Instead of 
her just, uh, just telling me, you know, here's the treatment, because, well, let, let me start it. Let me, let, me ref let me phrase it this way. A lot of the times, if uh, you go into a doctor's appointment, the system is like this. Ascertain the patient's symptoms and spit out a treatment, like a computer. Type in my symptoms, treatment. However, uh, what really should happen is, before any of that takes place, have a conversation about what the patient's goals are, why they're there. Because when I met with my dietitian, it was very different than most of her patients, because I didn't care what my current diet was at all. I'm willing to eat whatever it is. Um, I don't care how bad it tastes, because I want to be superhuman. And that's not the normal, uh, you know, the normal dietary issue that people have. And uh, then on the flip side, you know, if a patient came in and they, are, they love donuts and they refuse to give them up, then no matter how many times you tell them not to give up donuts, or if they have certain you know, religious, uh, they have to eat certain foods based on their religion, it's really good to know their goals in advance. And I think that it might be just because I'm a teenager, I think we're really diverse and also goal-oriented. Um, I, might, I might be a little subjective there, but I'd really like to have an appointment where it's all about me, <laughs> rather than just spitting out a treatment that could apply to anyone with my same diet. So again, meeting the patient where they're at means having the patient and the provider on the same team, but it also means having the patient be the primary driver of their own health care. And a patient like me is going to come in and say, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to come up with a diet that meets this, this, and this criteria. But some other patients are just going to say, fix me. And then, then at that point, it's your job to sort of educate them and say, you know, that's not really how the healthcare process works, but still figure out what their goals are and what they want to come out of that appointment with. So, it, and then instead of the patient leaving and going, I hate that doctor, and the doctor leaving going, there's no way the patient's going to follow that plan. <laughs> instead, I'll leave and go, wow, that doctor was really cool, and now I have this awesome new diet, and the doctor's going to leave going, man, that patient was smart, this is fun. So if that's what I want healthcare to look like now, uh, what do I want healthcare to look like in the future? <laughs> uh, just to let you know, this isn't really a prediction, like, here's what I think healthcare is going to look like in the future. But it's more of a wish. This is what I want healthcare to morph into if I had my say. And one thing that I think really needs to be incorporated yesterday is texting. And when I say texting, it doesn't have to be texting. It could be Twitter. It could be Facebook. Although, here's another thing about teenagers. We, no one uses the word new media. <laughs> it's not new. It's been around for like, well, technically, I mean, um, it's been around for a really long time, but even Facebook and stuff have been around for a, anything that's been around for more than two years is not new anymore. <laughs> and the other thing is, it's not media. If you, call, you don't call a telephone media, no one says, all right, I think I'm going to watch some Facebook today. That's now, it's a communication device. So if you, if you really want to, you can say social networks. But don't say new media. That just makes it sound old. <laughs> the reason that I think texting really needs to be included is because I didn't have time to go to the doctor for a really, really long time during my school year this year. Here was my schedule. Wake up at 6, work, go to theater practice, come home, work, go to bed at midnight. Every day. Weekends, work. Now, maybe not all teenagers are as dedicated to their homework as I am, because I'm a little bit crazy. But if I wanted to go to the doctor, I'd have to set up this whole appointment. I'd have to drive out there for two hours. I'd sit down for 15 minutes and answer one question. And I'd have to drive back home for a whole other hour. It's like, what a waste of time. Now, if I have one burning question, it's really simple. Like, my blood sugars have been high. Can I increase my lantus dosage by one? If I could just text that to my doctor, wouldn't that be so much easier? And another thing. <laughs> Another thing that texting does is it makes self-management uh, much more dynamic for the patient. So instead of having to, uh, my, my, friend, my other friend Carl's younger brother, he has diabetes as well. And his blood sugars are constantly running high or low. But how his looks like is, you know, it's running high for three months, goes into the doctor, they adjust his dosage, now it's low for three months, then goes into the doctor at the end of that, and they adjust his dosage again, and the whole thing starts over. And if he joined the tennis team or something, God, ah, just give up at that. But if you could just send a text that said, I just joined the tennis team, is there anything I could take into consideration? And receive a one line like, you know, you might want to drink, uh, drink more Gatorade, check out this 
uh, website for more info, that'd be so much better for the patient's uh, self-management. So how would that look like in practice? Well, because I'm kind of uh, weird like that, I have this whole model that I've made, and I call it the patient graduation model. You have to pronounce it like that or else it doesn't work. <laughs> this is how I'd like to see healthcare in the future. And I've kind of already done this, and I got a little pushback from my dietitian about it, as I, uh, as I told you. But <laughs> basically, I would want to see a lot more education at the beginning, very frequent appointments, you know, two hours long. I want to learn everything there is to know about diabetes, which is basically what I did, but kind of on my own. And then I would also want to text any questions that I had to my doctor in between times and really just learn as much as I can. Then the next year, have fewer appointments, but more contact via text, because now I understand a lot about my condition. I just need to adjust it to my lifestyle. Next year, maybe only one appointment, and I'll send you a couple questions via text message. And then the next year, maybe I wouldn't have any appointments. Because I've learned so much about my condition at this point, if it's based on education, that as a healthcare provider, if your patient doesn't need you anymore, you win. Because at that point, you may not have cured your patient of the disease, but you've cured your patient of ignorance. And you might be saying, okay, if my patients don't need me anymore, now I'm not getting paid and out of a job. Awesome! How is this going to work? But if this was to happen where the patients were educated more and got to the point where they could manage it almost all on their own, then here's what you have to understand. Sick people are a renewable resource. Unlike you know, the water supply on our planet, there are always more and more people getting sick. So if we can graduate patients, and of course they can still come back and see you if they need to, but if, if patients are learning enough to self-manage, instead of being able to treat 100 patients in X amount of time, you could treat 1,000, 10,000, and make a difference in so many more people's lives. Thank you very much.